Hello all, welcome to another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. Uh, I'm Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. We start again uh, by looking at our nice motivational image. Um, this is essentially a, a rover in Mars and uh, our motivation is to essentially design algorithms that help drive uh, autonomous systems such as these on the Mars. Now, let's go into a recap of what we did until last time. Right? So last time we sort of uh, started with the inner product space notion and we also define what is a Hilbert space, which is essentially an inner product space, uh, which is complete with the associated norm, right? And beyond that, we sort of went into much more detail of what is an induced matrix norm. We looked at the notions of supremum. Uh, we also, of course, under tried to understand uh, how supremum is defined right? and how to compute the supremum for functions and sets. Right? Now, uh, we also looked at a few important matrix properties, right? which is uh, properties of symmetric square matrices, which is something we are going to regularly refer to in our lectures uh, further. Right? So, one of the key properties being this sort of an inequality on a quadratic form, right? Um, we also saw how to compute the induced norm for a special cases, that is for the one norm, two norm, and the infinity norm. We saw how the matrix induced norm can be reduced to simple formulae, right? And we computed an example for this case. All right. Now, we were left with uh, trying to prove or, or look at the Cauchy Schwartz inequality for a uh, more general uh, induced norm case. So, if you remember uh, in the lecture before the last, we uh, while proving the norm property for the two norm or the Euclidean norm, we did look at uh, a Cauchy Schwartz inequality proof for a very specific case. So, what we want to do today is start off by proving this Cauchy Schwartz inequality for a general uh, inner product space, right? So, that's uh, sort of the first thing, yeah. So, that's sort of the first thing, right? So, so let's see, let's see. Suppose I want to do this, I will add a um, empty page, right? So let's see. Yeah, I will just add this kind of a pay. I will just, uh, and I want to move this. Here, right? And suppose I, so I mean, this is where I am. I have an empty page and I want to sort of uh, try to prove a general version of the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, right? So let's sort of begin. So, general Cauchy Schwartz inequality proof, right? So, this is one of the very, very critical inequalities that we will use for all sorts of. Uh, norms that is objects that is vectors matrices and so on so we want to definitely understand how this gets proven in general okay so suppose i have uh, suppose i consider the uh, norm of u right so let's see so so the first thing i can say is that i can always write a vector u as the inner product of 
uv divided by norm of v let's see uh, and in the direction v plus some vector w where v where we use the notation v is orthogonal to w right what does it mean for v to be orthogonal to w it means that the inner product of v w is zero so we so i hope this is sort of clear to you that any vector can be decomposed in this form okay okay any vector u can be decomposed in this form it can be written as a with two components one in the direction of v and one in a direction orthogonal to v right so it is very easy to sort of see in 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 the typical spaces right i mean if i have a vector right u and i have a vector v then i can always make an orthogonal vector w right and i can get projection here and projection here right and then this vector u can be written as sum of this and this and that's exactly what this expression right here is right so now if i want to compute the norm of u what do i do i take the inner product of u with itself because this is how i've defined the norm right in this inner product space and that is what that's essentially the same as taking inner product of uv divided by norm v times v plus the orthogonal component w and the same thing again uv divided by norm v orthogonal component and that's it that's the close and then i can use the inner product distributivity properties right if you remember the inner product is distributivity has is distributed right so this is one of the properties right if you notice the inner product can be distributed scalar quantities come outside and it is symmetric okay so using these three properties i will be able to manipulate this inner product on the right hand side so if you notice this guy is a scalar quantity right so is this guy right so what do i do i use the distributivity and the scalar multiplication property to write this as Right, this is the first piece v comma v yes this is the first piece that is v comma v okay. then the second piece would be well the second and third piece would be the same so i'm going to write it in it will come out as v comma w plus w comma w all right how do i get this again let's look at a little bit carefully the first piece here is obtained from this guy and this guy inner product of these two okay the second and the third piece are from this combination and also this combination all right Okay, both of them yield the same thing. This is because of symmetry of the inner product. All right, so that's the first uh, and the second term, and the third term is of course from here. Right, excellent. Now it's easy to observe that uh, the the left hand side is norm u square. The first term on the right hand side. is norm v squared like this the second term is actually zero right because this is exactly what you assume that v and w are orthogonal to each other right? so it's like an orthogonal uh, projections all right so this is zero right 
and so I'm left with so so this guy is sort of zero and I'm left with what I'm left with the last piece which is non w squared all right except now now norm of w squared is definitely something that's um, you know I know that this quantity is greater than or equal to zero right and so this in, this equality can be written as an inequality right because these two have now cancelled out let's see uh, wait a second wait a second let's see have i missed something out i feel like i am missing some term here so this is the projection is uv divided by norm v so that is the projection in the v direction and then i have something left in the w direction so this is okay and then I do an inner product, mm -hmm. which gives me two of these, right? Which is non v squared. Uh, all right. I would have thought that I would get something a little bit more. All right, let me go back to my source and let me see. Okay, so there is a problem with the decomposition. So there is, suppose it, there is seemingly an issue with this decomposition. Uh, it's supposed to be squared. Okay, it's supposed to be squared here, here, here and here right that makes sense all right that makes sense because because one of the norm v's is corresponding to making this quantity into a unit quantity and then the other norm v is to make this into a unit vector right because i, I write it in terms of unit vectors okay so this is fine this is fine absolutely this is okay all right so then I get actually, uh, let's see, uh, what I get here is a norm of V to the power 4 and that gets cancelled to become to the power 2. Yes. And so this can be written as this guy right and now if i compare these two ends yeah what do i get i immediately get my desired cauchy schwartz inequality that is uv less than equal to norm u times norm v right so all i've done is i have i have essentially moved this guy to the left right and i have gotten rid of the squares everywhere okay once i do these two things i am left with this all right so that should be evident okay so that's the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. All right. So this is the more general. Okay. So once you have this Cauchy Schwartz inequality in your belt, you will see that this is a very, very useful inequality. And then this is a this is just a you, you can see that this should remind you of you know something like this. Yeah, this is simply a variant of this. This can be proven using the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Yeah, so this should be very easy for you to understand. 
and this is not exactly the cauchy schwartz inequality like i say but this is actually a variant and this can easily be pro proved using what we have just shown okay all right so i leave that little bit of little piece to you all right now now that we've done um, vector norms and matrix norms we go to the next object which is signal norms all right so this should be uh, clear to you by now that we are going to be dealing with states which are functions of time outputs which are functions of time and control which are functions of time therefore we are not just dealing with vectors and matrices operating on these vectors but we are dealing with signals that is these vectors change as a function of time right so therefore we also want to deal with the notion of signal norms yeah so how do we define signal norms they are defined using vector norms yeah as you can imagine we already talked about this as mathematicians we like to uh, develop new notions based on our existing notions that we already are aware of so that's what happens regularly right like the induced matrix norm was developed using the vector norm right similarly the signal norm is also developed using the vector norm as a basis so what is the interesting thing about the signal norm uh, you will notice that the signal norm is not function not a function of time though the signals themselves are functions of time right so a signal norm somehow tells you something about the overall behavior all time behavior of a signal okay so this is something that uh, we should be aware yeah that that a signal norm always tells you something about the entire signal that is a signal for the entire span of time yeah so the first one is the p norm how do you define the p norm you define the p signal norm for a continuous signal for a continuous in time function if you may yeah and these can be vector signals as you can see right this is defined as you take the vector norm at each time take the pth power then you integrate over all time and then you take the pth root okay that's the idea take the vector norm to the pth power integrate it for all time and then take the pth root this is what is the p signal norm all right further if you look at the infinity norm as you notice the infinity norm is always different slightly different as compared to the rest of the norms right so the infinity norm is simply the supremum over all time of the vector norm of the signal okay so as you see in the first definition we integrate over time and in the second one you take supremum over time therefore the time argument completely vanishes on the left hand side and this is what i have said that the signal norms tell you something about the behavior of a signal for all time yeah it's like a global property of a signal if you may i mean global in time property of the signal okay now the important thing to notice is that the vector norm here is arbitrary yeah if you remember for the matrix norm i had mentioned very clearly that if you want the p induced matrix norm you take the pth you take the p vector norm here on the right hand side but now there is no such thing all right that is this p is coming from this p and this p all right this p has no connection to which vector norm you use and so you are free to use any vector norm the only requirement is that for one problem one complete problem you should not use different vector norm notions you should use the same vector norm for every norm computation in a particular problem otherwise there will be inconsistencies in your result yeah that's it. that's all you need to remember otherwise this is an arbitrary choice okay now as we mentioned already this norm xt signifies any vector norm and the choice is doesn't matter however do not switch in between that is in between a problem please do not switch between the vector norms okay so one of the important things about these um, signal norms is that they actually define spaces of signals in fact they define vector spaces of signals yeah? and this is a very very key very very critical notion yeah so what do we say we say that if xp is finite then 
for any p that is 1 to infinity then x is said to be in lp space okay, so lp is a vector space of signals okay uh, one of the critical things to notice is that until now when we talked about rn and rp and rk and so on we're talking about a finite dimensional vector space but here each lp you know for example l1 space l2 space etc etc is an infinite dimensional vector space because these are spaces of functions okay so if you've seen a serious course in uh, mathematical analysis and vector algebra and vector spaces you will know these notions if not you can read upon them but the idea is that each lp space that is l1 l2 l3 and so on and so forth l infinity each one of them is an infinite dimensional vector space yeah but they are vector spaces nonetheless okay and how do you categorize them you say that if a function has a finite lp norm then it belongs to lp space yeah and these are very very useful regularity conditions which appear in a lot of places in mathematics like approximation theory fourier uh, transforms and so on and so forth yeah so it's a very it's not just a significant here in the context of controls and adaptation but in a much more general setting in mathematics uh, these are rather critical spaces okay so um, anyway i mean uh, so we also have a discrete counterpart for this which is the small lp space what will happen all your for the discrete counterpart in these definitions the integral gets replaced by the summation that's it okay and then you have a small lp space instead of the cap lp like we have now but in this course of course we are concerned only with the capital lp space or lp space yeah another thing to notice is that a signal in l infinity is the same as the signal being a bounded signal okay so this is another important categorization to remember okay um, it's not very difficult to prove you know that this is what is the infinity norm of a signal right you know this is the infinity norm of a signal right so suppose i assume that uh, x t bounded what does it imply for a signal to be bounded implies there exists a positive number such that norm of x t less than or equal to m for all t greater than or equal to 0 this is what it means for a signal to be bounded okay so if the signal is bounded what happens to x infinity what can i say let's see i can say that notice that this quantity is less than or equal to m for all time so what does this imply this implies so this particular piece of information tells me that soup for all time of xt is also less than or equal to m all right and this immediately means that x is in l infinity right because the infinity norm is bounded great great so i hope that much is clear to you okay so now what about the other way around if the infinity norm is bounded so say i know that if x infinity is equal to m what do i know i know that soup of norm x t is equal to m right which implies and this immediately implies that norm x t less than or equal to m for all t greater than or equal to zero. Why? Why? Because soup is just a upper bound. It's the least upper bound, but it's still an upper bound. Right. Therefore, if you say that uh, soup x t is equal to m, then at each instant in time, that is, each norm x t has to be less than or equal to m. There is no choice. Okay. So done. And this is, of course, the definition of a bound. 
right, of a bounded function. So they are equivalent. These are equivalent motions. So as far as notation is concerned, the signal norm never has a time argument like I like you saw because the time argument gets neutralized by either integration or by you know taking supremum. While the vector norm always has the time argument. So please be very very careful even in the writing process. The signal norm never has the time argument but the vector norm has to be evaluated at an instant in time. Otherwise there is no question of a vector norm. It's not a vector at all if there is no time. Right? So we have to choose a particular time say one second. We have to insert that in x and then you get a vector, a fixed vector and then you can compute a norm just the way we have learned how to. All right. Great. So one of the cool things that we know about vector norms is not something we'll prove is the notion of norm equivalence. Okay. What is that? It says that you can take any two vector norms, say p norm and a q norm. All right. You can take any two vector norms and they are relatable by constants alpha and beta. That is the q norm is lower bounded by alpha times the p norm and upper bounded by beta times the p norm. Okay. So this is always true for any vector norm. However, one of the interesting things to note is that this is not possible in signal norms. Yeah. And it's very easily shown by a very simple counter example. Suppose I take x of t as the vector signal cosine t and sine t. All right. So this is a counter example of why such equivalence is not possible. Right. Now let's look at the infinity norm. Right. So I will compute x infinity. And what is this? This is soup t greater than or equal to zero norm x t. And I choose to use the two norm. Right, because it's easy to compute. So what is the two norm? So this is soup t greater than or equal to zero for sine squared t plus sine squared t. Right. And that's just equal to one. Because this this quantity is one. So supremum of one over all time is just one. Okay, so this is so what have we shown that the, the infinity norm is one. So I can even say that x belongs to L infinity as per our definition. Now let's try to compute say one norm. Okay, so, so what is x1? It is now integral 0 to infinity norm of xt. And I take the two norm, two vector norm here again, dt. Okay, what do I get here? I get again, this is just equal to one, so I get infinity here. And because the integrand is one, integrated from zero to infinity, so I get infinity. So what have I just seen? That x does not belong to L one. In fact, you can show that x does not belong to you can show that x does not belong to any lp right so what do we know we know that x belongs to l infinity so x belongs to l infinity not to any other lp right so therefore all the other signal norms become infinite and therefore, there is no such possibility of norm equivalence. All right. So it may just happen that it's a infinity norm is bounded, but the other norms are unbounded and so on. So therefore, there's no question of having inequalities like this, because this by definition means that all the vector norms have to be bounded. All the norms are bounded. Now in the signal norm case, one cannot even guarantee that all norms are bounded. A signal which is L infinity may not be L1. A signal which is L1 may not be L2 and so on and so forth. All right. So this is a rather critical thing to remember. There is no norm equivalence. Okay, great. So, so what have we sort of seen today? Uh, we have sort of uh, completed the proof of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for uh, you know a more general case, more general vector spaces, more general inner product space, if you may. Uh, after that, we started to look at the notion of signal norms which is the next level of notion that we need
to complete um, you know different proofs that will occur through you know uh, through this course uh, in the process we also learned about the notion of lp spaces right and uh, finally we also saw that uh, there is no non equivalence in lp spaces unlike the vector norms where non -equi norm equivalence is a pretty standard notion right great so this is where we will conclude today see you again next time thank you